Okay, thanks. So, good evening. Uh, we have a great opportunity tonight to have with us uh, one of the genuinely remarkable people who made a significant difference in the world that we're living in uh, to give us this year's McNamara Lecture. Uh, Mohammed al uh started uh, out as a great uh, foreign service officer for the government of Egypt. He uh, morphed into an uh, international public servant uh, par excellence at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which he rose to be the director of. And he and the International Atomic Energy Agency were recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee in 2005 in an award jointly to this remarkable organization and its leader. There are more details about him in the program. I want to remind you that tonight is a very special night for the Kennedy School because this is the Bob McNamara or Robert McNamara lecture, a lectureship which was created by the McNamara family and by the son-in-law Bob Pastor, one of our colleagues, now deceased, but a wonderful colleague, uh, to remember a person who played a very important role in the life of the Kennedy School. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, remember or don't know the history, I won't tell you the whole story, but uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you read Bobby Kennedy's memoirs, the single individual whom President Kennedy thought made the largest contribution to solving the problem without war was the Secretary of Defense, Bob McNamara. And Bobby Kennedy says that in his book. When the question came after the assassination of President Kennedy, what to do to remember him, the person with whom Bobby Kennedy, who played the most important role for the family, consulted with most was Robert McNamara. And when I was a graduate student, I had the opportunity to meet him as this process was going forward. So he took a great interest in the school through uh, the creation of the school. And then he was a frequent visitor here in the forum. So if you go to the forum's website, you can see him in the, here in the forum on a half dozen different occasions. Some when we were doing retrospectives on the Cuban Missile Crisis, some on the question of what about the future of nuclear weapons? So what about the fog of war? There's a great, uh, a great uh, forum here uh, on the fog of war, which was one of the uh, movies that were made or documentary. So it's a great opportunity to have uh, a lectureship remembering a person who made a huge difference in the Kennedy School, but also in the world, uh, if you think about the missile crisis, and to have as the lecturer a person who couldn't be more appropriate, Mohammed al who's been both a, a leader of an agency that's made a big difference with respect to the global nuclear order, and as a thinker about what needs to be done. In more recent years, another chapter of Mohammed's life was as a presidential candidate in the recent elections in Egypt. And I'm looking forward to the next two or three chapters of this remarkable life. So Mohammed, welcome and thank you. Dean Allison, Director Allison, uh, my very close friend, Graham, it's an honor uh, to be with you again here for, I think, the third time. And uh, you have done, Graham, to this school as much as anybody could have done. It's also an honor and pleasure for me to deliver the McNamara Memorial Lecture on War and Peace. Durable peace remains a quest that humanity continues to grapple with without success. Wars have dominated the human timeline since recorded history. Hundreds of millions have lost their lives to violence under the guise of religion, nationalism, ethnicity, and other causes barely. We can barely remember 
the causes of many of those wars. Some of the states involved no longer even exist. We organized ourselves around city-states, empires, and sovereign states. We created the League of Nations and the United Nations, but peace remains elusive. And force and violence remain the primary choice to settle differences. Today we are not doing much better. As I'm speaking to you, violence continues to ravage our planet. Senseless, destructive, dehumanizing conflicts. A mindset of Cartago de Linda Est. The time when the Roman Senator Cato finished every speech by saying, by the way, let us destroy Carthage. Unfortunately, even at the national level, we hear that a lot right now. By the way, let us destroy each other. What's worse due to the annihilating weapons at our disposal, there is an increasing danger of a sleepwalking into self-destruction. Robert McNamara used system analysis for making key decisions. A decision should be considered in a broad context, and a complex problem should be reduced to its component parts. I will try here to reflect on the broad context of war and peace, together with its constituent parts. There are two central questions before us. What are the drivers of war and peace? How are the mechanisms and institutions to promote peace and mitigate war are faring? First, let us take a brief look at the state of the world today. Poverty and hunger continue at dreadful levels. Some conflicts have been left to fester for generations. Brutal repression and denial of human dignity are the hallmark of a third of the world nations. The sanctity of life depends on who is dying and where. Rich countries are apathetic to the misery of the poor. The inequality in the distribution of wealth amongst countries and people has become obscene. The human rights law designed to protect human dignity and the humanitarian law intended that when we kill each other, we do it more humanely, are both now cited more for violation than for compliance. The responsibility to protect principle articulated in 2005 so the international community can guard against genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity now almost always rings hollow. And the international system of criminal accountability that created the International Criminal Court has so far been selective and limited to the weak and defeated. In the recent past, the international community has limited itself to hand-wringing, while millions of innocent civilians were slaughtered in Rwanda, Congo, Darfur, and other places. And today in Syria, we continue to witness yet more horrible carnage. Almost half the world population struggles to live on $2 per day. And some 900 million people do not have enough to eat. Today, by the way, is the World Toilet Day the UN World Toilet Day. Uh, two, and a, two and a half billion people do not have access to basic sanitation facilities. 1.8 billion people drink foul, foul dwell water. And half a, million, half a million children die every year as a result of that. But in contrast to that, 85 richest people on the planet now have as much money 
as the poorest three and a half billion people. Millions die every year because of lack of access to medical care. And I do not want to get into statistics. I often say that poverty is the most lethal weapon of mass destruction. I think Bob McNamara understood that quite well. When he went to the World Bank, he shifted the focus of the bank to targeting poverty. Because these are not just numbers. The plight of the poor is invariably compounded by and result in human rights abuses, a lack of good governance, marginalization, and a deep sense of injustice and humiliation, and anger. This combination is the most fertile breeding ground for conflict, civil strife, and other forms of violence and extremism. This environment of extremism and often authoritarianism continues to wear different masks of ideology, religion, ethnicity, and ultranationalism to commit the most heinous of crimes, either by non-state actors or by repressive regimes. Sadly, the ones footing the bill are the innocent civilians who are blithely dismissed as collateral damage. Shamefully, what we spend on human peacekeeping operations and disaster relief almost come to around 1%, 1% of what we spend on armaments. In such an environment, the logic among some is, if you don't treat me as human being, why do you expect me to act as one? And if you don't care about my life, why should I care about yours? It's an environment that breeds violence, tyranny, and fascism. In our increasingly interconnected world, however, our connectivity is not limited to opportunities but also to risk. Our most significant global threats are invari invariably threats without border. Poverty, terrorism, climate change, weapons of mass destruction, communicable diseases, cybersecurity, human trafficking, and illegal drugs. Our actions or non-actions eventually come back to haunt us, no matter where we are. No part of the world can be quarantined any longer. Our policies and international institutions are still designed for times past. The latter are highly polarized and increasingly paralyzed. They suffer from structural deficiencies and lack of authority and resources. One result is the dysfunctional system of collective security. The failure of the UN Security Council to take preventive measures or provide adequate responses over the years has led to conflicts continue to deteriorate, violence continue to rage, and misery continuing to spread. We are steadily, in my view, facing a crisis of governance. Governments pursue short-term myopic politics that fail to address long-term global challenges in need of cooperative policies, and international institutions that remain bereft of the tools and resources needed to address these challenges. Let's now look at the war machinery at our disposal. Nuclear weapons are a legacy of the Cold War. But a quarter of a century after the end of that war, it borders on insanity that we still have over 16,000 nuclear weapons, around 2,000 of them on alert. The abolition of nuclear weapons is alarmingly no longer a fashionable topic. Yet it is evident 
that with, with the technology out of the box. And as long as some countries choose to rely on nuclear weapons directly or through bilateral or multilateral alliances such as NATO, others will eventually seek to acquire them. A security concept based on some are more equal than others and on a system of deterrence that is irrelevant to extremist with no return address is unsustainable and almost naive. It raises a question of how long the center of the non-proliferation regime can hold in places like the Middle East, East Asia, and other areas of potential conflict. Or for how long we can live with a patchy nuclear verification regime that gives IA uneven and often limited authority. More ominously, how long will it take before a terrorist group lays its hand on a nuclear weapon? It is, of course, imperative that no more countries acquire nuclear weapons. But to that end, it is equally imperative that weapon states divest themselves of these weapons. Under the NPT, the weapon states not only have an obligation in good faith to negotiate nuclear disarmament, but equally in the world of the International Court of Justice, quote, the obligation to achieve a precise result, nuclear disarmament in all its aspects, unquote. However, after more than four decades of undertaking these obligations, nuclear weapon states are moving in completely the opposite direction. They are modernizing their arsenals. In addition, some of them cannot even commit to a ban on nuclear testing. As a result, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, CTBT, concluded in 1996, is yet to enter into force. And for the last 20 years, the proposal to conclude a fissile material cutoff treaty to prohibit the further production of fissile material for nuclear weapons remains dead in its tracks. In 2009, President Obama made a clear commitment, quote, to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons and, quote, to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. national security strategies, unquote. Yet, in 2014, the U.S. is planning to spend a trillion dollars to modernize its nuclear weapons arsenal, including authorizing a new generation of weapon carriers. This is the largest expansion of funding on nuclear weapons since the fall of the Soviet Union. As a result, these weapons will haunt us at least until the end of the century. Almost all pro prominent strategic experts in this country and beyond, including two great minds who delivered this very lecture, Sam Nunn and Bill Perry, have argued strongly that reliance on nuclear weapons is becoming increasingly hazardous and decreasingly effective. In 2008, Samnan stated in this forum, I believe that America would be far more secure if no one had nuclear weapons. He concluded that we are moving in the wrong direction. In 2011, Bill Perry talked about three false alarms he knows of in which Soviet missiles were thought to be screaming towards the US. To this day, I believe that we avoided nuclear catastrophe as much by good luck as by good management, he added. McNamara put it in stark terms. The indefinite combination of human fallibility and nuclear weapons will lead to the destruction of nations. 
There will be no lear learning period with nuclear weapons, he said. This led McNamara to the inevitable conclusion that, quote, the only way to eliminate the risk is to eliminate nuclear weapons. President Obama emphasized the same. He said, one nuclear weapon exploded in one city, no matter where it happens, there is no end to what the consequences may be, ultimately for our survival, unquote. In his summary, the chairman of the second conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons held in Mexico earlier this year with the participation of 146 states, but with the significant absence of all the weapon states party to the NPT. He stated, today the risk of nuclear weapons use is growing globally as a consequence of proliferation. The vulnerability of nuclear command and control network, not, networks to cyber attack and to human error and potential access to nuclear weapons by non-state actors, in particular terrorist groups. He went on to say, as more countries deploy more nuclear weapons on higher level of combat readiness, the risk of accidental, mistaken, unauthorized or unintentional use of these weapons grows significantly. The third such conference will be held in Austria next month. The US has announced that it will attend. This is at least a step in the right direction. And I hope that other nuclear weapon states will follow suit. But with all these warnings, have we put our money where our mouths are? Have we seriously tried to drastically reduce the number of weapons in existence? When no limits was set under the New START Treaty on the number of operationally inactive nuclear warheads? Have we seriously tried to alter the nuclear launch warning system? Have we seriously tried to reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons in national security strategy? Have we seriously started thinking about the security architecture in a nuclear weapon free world, including the need to deter and defeat possible cheats? This is, in my view, is a dismal record and raises the question whether our commitment to nuclear disarmament is genuine. In addition to nuclear weapons, other weapons of mass destruction are still with us. If you rely on the mother of all inhumane weapons, and I have security concerns, why should I commit not to acquire other WMDs? This, I assume, is the logic of some of those who have not joined the Convention on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons or the Convention on the Prohibition of Biological Weapons in the regions of Middle East and East Asia. Forget even that the Convention on Biological Weapons has no verification mechanism, despite efforts that came to naught in 21, given the opposition of the United States. In addition to the global non-proliferation treaties, we have control regimes that are designed to tighten export control of sensitive equipment and material relevant to these weapons. Membership in these regimes is based on subjective political criteria. The nuclear supplier group, for example, does not include India and other non-NPT states. The Australia group of export control on chemical and biological materials exclude China and India, even though they are parties to the conventions. The Missile Technology Control Regime, MTCR, does not include China. These regimes, to my mind, create two categories of states. Reliable suppliers and not so reliable suppliers or recipients. 
But in the absence of agreement by all, suppliers and recipients, on the end game, a regime is fragile and vulnerable. Security in the long run cannot be based on withholding know-how, but on addressing security deficits and resolving conflicts. Every state, irrespective of its nature or orientation, and in the absence of an equitable, inclusive, reliable, and verifiable security system, will do what it takes to protect itself against perceived threats and insecurity. In the recent past, we have made awful blunders and wrong choices in the way we manage some of our WMD-related WMD conflicts. With waging war in Iraq based on falsehood, the best option available, were the hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children dead or the stunted one-third of North Korean children under five, many of them victims of blunt sanctions, a cost we had to pay? And has the inhumane collateral damage achieved its intended purposes? or in fact, the reverse, by inspiring antipathy toward the West and sympathy for the incumbent regime. Was the US refusal for years to have direct talks with Iran the best option? Or would it have been better to have pursued a dialogue similar to the one ongoing now that could have possibly spared the Middle East much agony? Was the access of evil branding and chatter about regime change, relying on the power of fear, the best way to create trust and a sense of security in Iraq, Iran, and North Korea? Or would it have been better to engage them and provide them with security assurances in return, in return for change of behavior? To conclude, War and peace, like many human conditions, are of our own creation. It depends on the environment we construct, our perception and blend of realism and idealism, and the mindset we cultivate. What we need is an environment based on equity, trust, mutual respect, and dialogue, and not on double standard, polarization, humiliation, and dictates. An environment that constrains the human impulse for violence. What we need is a mindset that understands that in our globalized world, we will either swim together or sink separately. If we work on eliminating the drivers of insecurity and war and abolishing all weapons of mass destruction, the odds are we will be able to avert or at least mitigate most wars. If we work on the drivers of peace, the odds are we will be able to restore our rationality and understand that we are the same human species, irrespective of our superficial differences of race, religion, or ethnicity. We will realize that we are increasingly share the same core values. It's the same cake, but with different icing. Equity, compassion, and above all, human solidarity should be our compass. If we maintain the status quo and the same mindset, possibly we will be able to travel to Mars, but certainly we will continue to kill each other. One day, I shudder to think we might see Rajiv Gandhi's warning in 1998 come through, when India was still hoping for a world free from nuclear weapons, a nuclear war that would mean the end of life as we know it in our planet Earth. In 2005, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee stated that in recent decades, 
quote, it concentrated on the struggle to diminish the significance of nuclear arms in international politics with a view to their abolition. That the world has achieved little in, that res in this respect makes active opposition to nuclear arms all the more important today, unquote. These words are as relevant today as they were then. Bob McNamara had the courage to take a stand against his own conduct during the Vietnam War. We were wrong, terribly wrong. We owe it to future generations to explain why. And then he said his famous quote, how much evil must we do in order to do good? These words should be our starting point. Anything less will not do. Thank you. Great. So I think uh, you can now see why we couldn't conceivably have uh, a more appropriate McNamara lecturer this year than Mohamed Alberde. We've come to the part of the program where you get a chance to ask questions. There are two microphones here on the ground floor and two on the loge. The procedure you should be familiar with, but let me say it again. Please introduce yourself. Questions are only one per customer. Uh, you can make a short comment if you want to make a comment, but certainly not a speech. We have a great opportunity for many people to hear from uh, Dr. Alberade. And we'll start with this gentleman, so please introduce yourself. Dr. Alberadoi, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ramin Amen. I'm a graduate student and a researcher at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy here at the Kennedy School. My question is, with the disastrous outcomes of Western involvement in Libya, where the rule of law is non-existent and interstate conflict reigns as prominently as Qaddafi's tyranny once did, how do you convince governments to stop dragging their feet in upholding the responsibility to protect when it's often popularly perceived as a guise for militarily exploiting weak states at their greatest vulnerability. How do you even convince citizens to pressure the US and other governments when arguments could be made that we could save thousands of lives? Thank you. Well, I think I, in many ways I answered that question that uh, we need to move from international policies or politics based on geopolitical interests to international policies based on human solidarity. Uh, when, and I just mentioned, when we value human life anywhere the same we do, we always know exactly how many Westerners lost their life, but we vaguely keep record of the natives who get killed in other places. This is a reality. It is not that we have different values, it's just we have a blinker approach to how we perceive our inter increasingly globalized world. I think your question has a lot to do with the way the Security Council is dysfunctioning. It has to do with a lot of change of mindset in governments and government, are, you know, so to think in, in, in long term policies and not on perspective of midterm election. You know, that, I mean, what you are really saying about the Middle East overall is imploding. And the key for now us to do is to see how we can move it into the right direction. But it's not only the US, it's not the West. People should take matter in their own hand. People of the region have to understand that you do not want to go through another 30 years of war. You, you do not want to go another First World War to discover that at the end of the day, the only solution that we need to live together, irrespective of our color, ethnicity, race, or, or sect. I mean, these are, I don't think, I hope that we will not go through the European experience of 300 years to come to that conclusion. Uh, and I hope we will do a lot of it on our own, but also, uh, the rest of the world should, should help a good deal. I think 
they can help a good deal, not by providing arms, but by providing soft power. You know, thriving civil society, education, health care. Uh, treat people like human beings, they'll act as human beings. This gentleman, please. Thank you, Dr. Albardai. My name is Cameron Consarinia, a freshman at the college. Uh, a lot of your experience uh, with the IAEA was with Iran uh, and uh, is, is in the, the government there and its relations to the West in regards to its nuclear program. Uh, and a lot of what you talked about today was trying to decrease the amount of nuclear weapons and the proliferation thereof in the world. So how do we present, uh, how do we prevent the Iranian government from developing nuclear weapons uh, when we failed thus far? And how do we also rectify uh, with that Iran's right to develop peaceful nuclear energy for domestic purposes and also the right of the Iranian people to have a government that treats them with respect, which for the past 30 years it has not had? How do we rectify those things, particularly uh, in Iran? Well, I wouldn't say particularly in Iran. I think your question, uh, you know, applies to everywhere else. I mean, how do we have a system of arms control that based on objective criteria and not subjective criteria? If you are my friend, then it's all right to have enrichment or reprocessing. If I don't like you, then you cannot touch nuclear technology. I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of issues, of course, human rights issues, uh, governance issues, democracies issues. These are issues, and as I said, the, we have one third of our world continue to live under authoritarian dictatorship. But it doesn't mean that if we do that, that we continue to you know, apply you know, or nurture a culture of fear that will end up, that we will, self, will destroy each other. You know, these countries are, I think in my view, you know, the key and on the Iranian issue and on many other issues is a proposal I talked about a few years back that you need to control access to the fissile material. I still believe that the only long-term solution is to multinationalize all the reprocessing and enrichment facilities. Uh, but unless you, you move on, on doing something objective, you know, uh, it will not work. I mean, if people, North Korea or Iran or, or country X or Y, See, the big boys are still relying on nuclear weapons. When you hear that you are modernizing your weapons, when I hear President Putin say, at the end of the day, you know, we are a nuclear weapon state, you know, how do you expect countries who perceive rightly or wrongly that they are insecure, that they might be attacked, to behave? You know, so it's, we need to focus on building trust, you know, and building trust at all levels. You know, it's, it's in, on the issues of human rights, on the issues of democracy. Uh, I, I think the agreement, and I've said that publicly before, the agreement you might have with Iran, and I hope you do have one, because an agreement with Iran right now will be a key to stability in the Middle East in many ways. You know. uh, that agreement could have, could have been concluded 10 years ago. I, Iran at that time was ready, and again, I, I might have to mention that. Iran at that time was ready to cap its enrichment to an R&D level. We were talking at that at one point about 360 centrifuge. Iran right now have 20,000 centrifuge. They have all the, all the knowledge and some, you know, and this is to me, again, I'm not apportioning blame, but this is to me a mismanagement of policy, you know, and again, you, if you do not have an agreement today, you should ask yourself, what would be the outcome? The outcome will be much worse, in my view, much worse Middle East, imploding Middle East, you know, uh, more violence, more war. So it is, it is not black and white. You need just to need to see what's prioritized and you need, in, in my experience at least, reaching out to people is much more effective than trying to say, we are going to apply sanction against you. Sanction, in my view, never worked. Gentlemen in the lounge, please. Uh, good evening, my name is Nicolas Miai. I'm French, I'm a mid-career student at the Kennedy School here. And my question to you, sir, is you've been at the center of the uh, armament versus disarmament dynamics for, for many, many years. Uh, what do you think and how do you think a, a new factor called uh, the cyber worlds and the issues of cyber securities are going to disrupt the way nations are able to build trust among themselves? And when I see the way Iran nuclear program was uh, disrupted by this virus called Stuxnet, 
uh, I see a, a great source of disruption. How do you see this in Im impacting the, the, the dynamics that you've been uh, working in? The way I see it, that, as I said, that you will not have a security system based on denial of technology. Sucks you know, was, you know, pretty soon you will see a virus like that proliferating, if you like, you know. And there's a lot of concern right now about cybersecurity, that how, you know, how we can protect our energy infrastructure, our banking infrastructure. So trying to outbid each other uh, through use of more destructive technology is, will end up, as I said, that will, will end up in a sleepwalking into self-destruction. I, I think you know, what, what's happening with cybersecurity is a major issue. I mean, we need to focus on, but we need to have in all these issues, cooperative policies. You know, we, we don't like each other, fine. We, we have different approaches, fine. But, but there are some issues that we need to understand unless we have agreement on some basic values of survival, we will self-destruct. Mohammed, I was in Dubai uh, uh, last week or the, maybe the week before for the World Economic Forum, and one of the people in the small group dealing with nuclear issues was a fellow who runs Eurinco, which is the enrichment facility in Europe. And he said that then the issue of cyber came up uh, and Stutznets, and he said, but nobody had, re had thought, in his view, that almost all the uh, uh, Eurinco machines are the same Siemens machines that are infectable by the same yeah. Stutznet's virus. <laughs> uh, so he wished somebody would call him up next time. <laughs> this, this gentleman. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, Dr. Barate. My name is Ahmed Al Swedi. I'm a grad stu graduate student from the United Arab Emirates. I have another question about Iran. Sure. Um, one could argue that there's a certain amount of nervousness among governments in the Gulf states towards the dialogue that's currently happening between the U.S. and its allies and Iran on achieving a nuclear deal. Do you believe that this nervousness is justified or is it paranoia in, in regards to sort of Iran exercising more influence in the region? And do you think we can achieve a lasting peace in the region without giving um, the Gulf states a seat at the negotiating table? Well, the, there is understanding of nervousness, but the understanding of nervousness goes much deeper because you have a, a region like, as, as I mentioned today, that is melting down. You have a country like Libya, like Syria, like Iran, or is almost disintegrating. Uh, you have ethnicity, which has never been, you know, an issue we talked about in the Middle East becoming to the forefront. We have a majority of people in the Middle East craving for human dignity, access to food, health care, education. Uh, you have competition of power. You have Israel sitting you know, on a nuclear arsenal. You have a fear in Israel about, as you call it, existential threat. You have the Palestinian feeling that they have been humiliated. I mean, these are, these are the real issues where we should be nervous about. And these are the issues should be put on the table. In my view, the only solution right now in the Middle East is to have a peace conference that put all these issues that are very much linked to each other. You know, something what you have done after the First World War, something that you have done maybe in Yugoslavia. I mean, the outcome might not have been the greatest in these cases, but, but you cannot delink any of these issues. I mean, if you talk about the Iran nuclear issue, you have to talk about Shiite and Sunni. You have to talk about human dignity. You have to talk about the Palestinian issue. And you have to have a regional security system, which doesn't exist in, in the region right now. You have, you know, you have a, the Arab League, which in my view is completely dysfunctional. Uh, what you have right now is an environment based on distrust. As I said, uh, it's, it's a, an environment when you wake up in the morning and you read the newspaper, it's, it's let us destroy Carthage. You know, it's basically that's, that's the mindset right now. You know, we need to change that and saying we have a lot of history, a lot of geography, a lot of common elements, much more than even the European Union. Why can't we understand that we need to live together and forget all these superficial differences and act as human beings and work together and have people like you and your generation future 
you know, when they would like to have access to technology, when they would like to have access to, you know, uh, you know mobility, that is, that's what we need to focus on. And not, in my view, that the Iranian issue is a tip of an iceberg, in other words. And you need to go deeper into other under, understanding the underlying issues. This gentleman, please. Thank you so much, sir, for your presentation. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm the Vice President Communications at the Student Government at the Kennedy School. My question is about a scenario of, you know, the I ISIS in Syria, for instance, capturing the chemical weapons of Assad. Is that a scenario that you are worried about? Secondly, do you think the black market business is entirely closed down the AQ Han chapter, or do you think there could also still be rock scientists, you know, trying to collaborate with the organizations like ISIS? What's the scenario that will emerge in a situation like this? Does, does that worry you? Thank you. Well, I think, unfortunately, so far, we have been, the, our world is wor working on the basis of shock treatment, you know. You have uh, Chernobyl, you know, before you started thinking about nuclear safety. You had 9-11, then you started to talking about nuclear security. We had Iraq in 1991, then everybody jumped and said, well, the IA need to do something and get some authority. Uh, I hope what, what you're talking about will not happen. But am I, you know, go to sleep comfortably at night? Yes, I do, because I'm not a director general any longer. But, <laughs> but, but, but these are scenarios that, that you know, you, can, you do not want to wait until something happens. And these are risks that we are living with. And people, again, somebody mentioned, people need to get involved in these issues, you know. We, people until now say arms control, defense issues are too sophisticated for us to get involved. So let's get involved in environment and trade. Well, they need to get involved in, uh, and saying, well, this is not the kind of system I would like to live under. This is not, I do not want to live under the Democles sword of nuclear weapons. I mean, but governments are not going to change until people do change and people will change and when they get involved and it's a through education where we can move forward. And that's why a forum like that, you know, and, and not just talking to each other here, frankly, but people are here should be the apostles of a different message that we need a different mindset because what we have right now, the kind of values we live by are not sustainable in my view. Please. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Dr. Baradai. My name is Joy. I'm a sophomore at the college from Lebanon. And my question also deals a bit with ISIS. And I was wondering that you co consistently and historically we have seen that the knee-jerk reaction to terrorist organizations like, uh, like ISIS has been to bomb them and to uh, use military force quite heavily as the only solution. What do you think or do you think that uh, there is a more peaceful and more effective way of dealing with non-state actors that continue to propose a humanitarian and even nu nuclear uh, threat to us? Well, you need, unfortunately, when you have something like ISIL, you have to rely on force, you know. But force alone, clearly, is not the solution. I mean, force is a short-term solution. The long-term solution, the sustainable solution, is a political solution. By asking yourself, why do we have ISIL? How did ISIL came about? Uh, is ISIL the result of disbanding the Iraqi army uh, and getting rid of all the disgruntled Sunnis, member of the Iraqi army? Who got religion into politics? Did that start in Afghanistan? And who is behind that? I mean, and again, I'm not trying to apportion blame, but uh, we need to, uh, to ask ourselves hard questions, you know, and saying, yes, we need to maybe use sh force because ISIL is, is a horror. You know, but in order to avoid that we do not have another ISIL 2, 3, and 4, we need to create a different environment so these people will not be, will not be there again. I mean, I, there is a lot. Again, you're coming from the Middle East. It's, I need to work on the drivers of peace. People there need to feel that they have their dignity, which is absolutely lacking like, like, right there. 
People talk about democracy. People talk, I mean, to me, it's one word. It's human dignity. You wake in the morning, you wake up in the morning, and you feel that you are being treated as a human being. If you do that, I don't think we'll have ISIL. I don't think we'll have the, you know, uh, Al Qaeda. And, uh, and we have to have a policies. I mean, right now, we don't have a policy. In, in Syria, do we have a policy? I don't think we do have a policy. I mean, bombing ISIL is not going to work, you know. Uh, and in many cases, again, I should, you know, we should not be too idealistic. Sometimes you have to choose between the bad and the worst, you know. I mean, we have been talking about Bashar al-Assad as a horrible dictator. He is a horrible dictator. But you need to compare some time between Bashar al-Assad and ISIL, you know. Uh, it, it, is not, it is not always, you know, a, a, a black and white situation. But you have to have a clear vision. Where do you want to go? You have to understand that we're dealing with a very, very complex issues. And you have to understand that at the end of the day, it's political solutions and not military solutions. We have seen how the military, you know, solution in Afghanistan. We have seen the military solution in, military solution does not feed the hungry, you know, does not cure disease, you know, and you need it sometime, but as you need to use force when it is the last resource available and the best available. And I think we are too quick in many cases in using force thinking this is a solution. And usually it, it creates, it opens new wounds. It doesn't, it doesn't heal the old one. So please, this gentleman. Hello, Dr. Baraday. Thank you. I'm Daniel. I'm a master of public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I have another follow-up question regarding ISIS. This week they have taken over a city in Libya. They seem to be expanding. Um, and they seem to be attracting a lot of followers. What is the best way for Muslims to rediscover a more peaceful version of Islam? Well, I think, I mean, again, I talked about the Middle East, and we do not want to go through the European model of 300 years of war, you know, and religious war, ethnic war. But also, we have to remember that Europe went through reformation in the 16th century. Luther was there, Calvin was there, and I think we need, we need a reformation. You know, in, you know, everybody now speak in the name of Islam and saying this is a religion. You know, we need to go seriously and under, you know, through a reformation process. Europe also, side by side with wars, went through the age of reason, 17th and 18th century, rationally. You know, we need to go the same thing. Hopefully it would not take us as much, because, and hopefully we, we need to learn from others' mistakes. But these are issues we need. We need to put these issues. We have to have the guts and courage to understand our ills, put the problems on the table, and deal with it. Please. Your Excellency, my name is Junius Williams. I'm a freshman at the college. In what opinion did the 2013 removal of President Mohamed Morsi represent a return to Mubarak era politics in Egypt? Well, I'm talking here as a director emeritus of the IAA. Um, but, uh, well, unfortunately, again, you know, we, there was a situation in Egypt at that time when we were on the verge of a civil war. Uh, the problem was, I think, with Mr. Morsi at that time, he did not reach out. You know, it was a very polarized society. Uh, and at, at that time, until today, the solution is a more inclusive, pluralistic society. Uh, when you move after 50 or 60 years of repression, as it was in the case in many countries in the Middle East, you cannot just say tomorrow we are going to be a democracy and we are going to settle our differences through competition. It doesn't work. You know, democracy is culture, is institution, is not instant coffee. And in in the kind of situation we have right now in many of the Arab countries or Arab Spring countries, so-called, what you need is an inclusive approach. You know, you have to have everybody on board. You know, you have to understand how to live with each other and you have to, to see how you can develop a basic law by which everybody can live by. You have I mean, the same way you have the Tea Party and ACLU here, you know, they live together, you know. They have a lot of differences, they can, but you need to, f but at least there are certain basic norms that prim permeate society. 
due process, independent judiciary, uh, you know, uh, uh, free, hopefully, electoral process, all that sort of thing. So the key, again, is to learn from the mistakes committed, is to try to look to the future, is to try to understand that everybody should be on board if a country or a nation should move forward. Sir, please. Hello, Dr. Baradai. It's an honor to have you here. My name is Mohammed Salim. I'm a medical student. I work at Harvard. So my question is actually asked the first part of my question. So the second part, um, what do you think about what's going on currently in Egypt, especially in Sinai and the fighting terrorism and what's going on with the Egyptian government, so fighting the terrorism? What do you think? Do you think it's going to escalate down there? Do you think there is a special measures the Egyptian government needs to take? I don't know. I think, frankly, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, extremism has to be encountered by use of force. But as I've said, when I moved away in a year and a half ago from the Egyptian political scene, violence breeds violence. You need to move into an inclusive approach. You need to settle your differences through peaceful means. And there is obviously extremism that needs to be encountered. But in addition, we have to understand that the ultimate solution in Egypt is transitional justice and is a reconciliation process. That is the only way we, we can move forward. So I think this lady is next, yes? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Kish. I'm an alumni of the college. You started your remarks this evening talking about how peace was elusive and referring to the, the Romans who were calling for the destruction of Carthage. Our discussion has talked about issues in the Middle East. We've barely touched on even issues around the Ukraine and tensions with Russia. But my question is this. If you were to have started your career today, not 30, 40 years ago, and your mission was to attain this elusive peace, would you have chosen that same career, those same choices in terms of what you study and what you do? I never really, as I s said the other day, I never, I never planned my career. So it mushroomed in that direction. And I, but if I would have studied law, for sure. If I would have got involved into public policy, for sure. Was it always fun? Not at all. You know, but there was a sense of satisfaction sometimes when, when you see that even 10% were moving in the right direction, that we are feeding some some hungry people that were giving access to uh, some medical care. Yes, we do, I do, I mean, but, and that is, we need to be more, more realistic in, in how we approach our world. I, it's a challenge, frankly. I mean, if everything is dandy, you know, that's, you know, I don't think it's a challenge. I mean, I like to see things, you know, need to be fixed. So it, it brings, you know, it, it moves your cells, cells on your brain. and. At my age, I need to do that, you know. <laughs> but it's a, it's, it's a question of, we have to understand one thing, as I said, which is, Bob McNamara understood, and, and many others, you know, that force is not the way, you know, violence is not the way, stereotyping each other is not the way. And uh, we, we just need to understand that we are a very complex machines. You know, we have our good part, our, our bad part, and we need to focus on the good part. I always ask myself that question. I mean, I, why do we have Mother Teresa and suicide bomber? You know, they're both, you know, they're both born to this world. Eh? One ended up being, you know, Mother Teresa, and the other one ended up destroying himself. So it's an environment. I think the key, the challenge for us is the environment we create. So. Everybody feels that he's being treated as human being. And the number I gave you, you know, when you have now, and people are very happy that we have more uh, mobile phones than toilets. It, there's something wrong with our world. This gentleman. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Barade. My name is Mohammed Saleh. I'm a student uh, from University of Toronto, interning here. And I have a bit of a general question, but being someone who's uh, very successful, uh, I'd like to ask it to you. Being someone who's lived a significant portion of your life divided between your, dividing your time between your homeland and other nations, 
Um, what advice do you have for someone who's trying to reconcile their responsibilities to their homeland versus their responsibilities to their new home? I think home is right now is a planet, you know, whether we like it or not, you know. Where, wherever you work, wherever you do good, uh, you are doing good to humanity. And if you're doing good to humanity, you are doing good to every single country in the world. So don't worry about that issue. Okay, this gentleman. Uh, my name is Hajime. I'm a mid-career MPA student at the Kennedy School from Japan. Uh, you emphasize the need to eliminate nuclear weapons. Um, what concrete steps do you think P5 uh, should take to uh, realistically move forward toward that goal? And especially, what are your expectations for U.S. leadership in that um, action? Well, I think, I think the U.S. and Russia has to take the lead. There's no question about it. I mean, the, the measures they can take are easy to identify. You know, I, I mean, everybody here, <laughs> Gary Seymour will tell you exactly what needs to be done, and Graham will tell you. I mean, they, they are not. The question is, are we really genuine about our commitment to nuclear disarmament? I mean, that is, that's a, the key issue. But if we want to move in that, I'm not sure that you are really protecting yourself, frankly. I mean, even from a, a selfish point of view, I'm not sure that you are much, that the US is better protected by living in a world when you have nuclear weapons. I don't think that's the case. But, but we need, again, you need, you need to do that. You need, uh, when I see, again, I mean, I mentioned, when I see Henry Kissinger, eh? Henry Kissinger is saying that we need to have a world free from nuclear weapons. But Henry Kissinger is not, is not the more idealistic guy. I mean, he's the creation of the, of the Cold War. But, you, and then he, he came at his mature age to that conclusion. You know, Sam Nunn, Bill Perry, you know, you know George Shultz, you know, and we need to listen to these people. But again, you, you, if to do that, I mean, are you, are you going to be able to do that in this kind of environment now you have with Russia? I mean, is your policy versus Russia is the right policy? Is to trying to create the perception in Russia that you are trying to encircle them and in the way you, they have been treated after the dissolution of the Soviet Union? I mean, in all the issues I'm talking about, starting from the Middle East to Iraq to anywhere, to Asia, you need Russia on board, you need China on board, you, you, need, the, you need the new comers, you need India on board. You need Brazil on board. You know, I mean, this, the world has changed and we have to understand. We need all the major actors and we need a cooperative policies. So we're coming close to the end, but we have several people here, so we're not gonna take any more microphones and we're doing on this one. You're next. Uh, my name is Ihab El Gamal, uh, mid-career. I'm from Egypt as well. So you presented a very good argument about how the US need to understand the environment and how, what, what it needs to be doing. I don't know why the US is not listening because we've been singing the same song for a very long time. Most of the Arab intellectuals have been saying the same aspect. So why is you not listening and how are we gonna make them listen? Well, that has to go into the US domestic policy. I mean, if, if the US politician ha have, have not been listening, then you have not been doing a very good job. You know, I mean, simply you need to get you know, to the average Joe and make him understand your argument. You know, uh, what I see right now today, for example, I mean, uh, you know, again, it's, uh, you know, let us destroy Carthage, you know, at the domestic level, here and in everywhere else. That's, that's uh, that. Rather than saying, we have a problem, say, with immigration, we have a problem with health care, uh, let us find a way to, you know, to work together. Uh, but what, I mean, these are, I do not want to get into the US domestic politics, but that is a state of mind everywhere, you know, and uh, you need to move from the intellectual powerhouse like here into being able to convince people in the middle America. And if you haven't, then you haven't done your job. I think this is the last question, please. My name is Khaled, I'm from Egypt, I'm a mid-career student. At I mean, have the Egyptian in here. Yeah, right? yeah, we're, uh, <laughs> we might start a let revolution. Let me just check one second. Was this other gentleman in line or no? no, no. Good, so okay. you're the last, good. So it's my last question. It's the last question. Um, 
Thank you for the alarming facts you've mentioned in your speech. But uh, I think it's a fair statement to say that Kennedy School students are very big in hope. And we survive on hope. Like everyone I spoke to, they just want to change the world. And I would like to use my last question to uh, just to say something for Kennedy School's uh, students who are full of hope. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I mean Kennedy School for me is, is a sign of hope. Uh, not only that, you know, I have some of my closest friends here, but it is a sign of hope, you know, because it's only by asking the hard questions that we would be able to move forward. I come here every, every week to the Belford lunch, and I, I was telling Ida, my wife, frankly, that you know, it's an enriching experience. You, you are forced to think about difficult questions, and you are forced to try to find solutions. And it's only by asking the questions, is also all by not taking ourselves uh, you know, very seriously and understand that we have a lot to do, uh, then we will be able to move forward. So again, kudos to Kennedy School. Kennedy. I think a very uh, appropriate question to end on. And if you think about uh, Mohammed was a student, uh, you know, about as old as some of you here. He has set off on a career to this point in which the world is safer. Thank goodness for the work that he and the IAE have done. So for giving us a lecture tonight that will give us a lot to think about, let's say thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. It was a great last question. Many people will want to come and shake your hand. So just